Hey, thanks for watching this sermon from New Life Church. We believe the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. We hope this message is a blessing to you today. But 2 Timothy chapter 1, um, as I was thinking about our time this morning, and um, I was just praying, reading through uh, the scriptures, but, but this idea came to mind, all right? This idea, and that, I, and, that, and that big idea was, you know, the days in which we live, the time in which we live, the, 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 the part, the time of history that we all find ourselves in. And the days that we are needing to live out, uh, obviously there's, our desire is that um, we're able to live out those days in victory. Uh, let me say it this way. I almost, if I was going to title this message, which I very rarely give a title to uh, my messages, but if I was going to title it, I initially thought of what we need to survive in these days. But I didn't like the word survive because I don't think the, I don't think the Lord is calling us just to survive. You know, like we basically make it, you know, oh, the end of our lives. Woo, that was nip and tuck. Not sure I was going to make it, but I made it, you know. I don't believe that's how the Lord wants us to live out our lives and even end our lives. The Bible says we go from strength to strength, glory to glory, from faith to faith. That we're more than conquerors, not barely conquerors, right? We're more than conquerors. And so I, don't, I didn't like that title. I don't, again, I don't give titles. So, but my point in saying that is, this is not, the, the, the things I want to share are, are not things that we need to survive. These are the things we need to live out our lives in the victory that Jesus has called us to. To be the people he's called us to be. For you and I to be the husbands that we need to be. For us uh, to be the, the parents that we need to be. For the women to be the wives or the mothers that they need to be. That we fulfill the purpose, the calling that God has placed on our lives individually. And even, and even more importantly, collectively as the church. That we, we truly are an expression that really reflects his greatness and his glory. Not a reflection that's kind of twisted or faint or weak, but a strong reflection of his redemption. Amen? That we're an expression of that. And so as I was, as I was uh, uh, thinking along those lines, I, there were several scriptures that came to mind and, and obviously several points or ideas that came to mind in regards to what are some of the things that we need in these days that we find ourselves in. And, and I, I, I can look at these, and these are the things that I need. These are the things that I need happening, that I need to be a part of my life for me to experience the victory that God has for me. And I, I believe it's the same for all of us here. So the first one is, in the days in which we're, we're living right now, we need, here's one of the things we need. We need to keep the fire alive. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, here's what Paul tells this young man. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift, to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So he's reminding Timothy in this moment that Timothy's in. I'm reminding you to stir up the gift. So Timothy is pastoring at this point, he has followed Paul in the past. He was one of Paul's disciples. Now Timothy is pastoring the church in Ephesus, a coastal town, very wealthy town, very large church. Historians say the church of Ephesus was probably around 40,000. But now Nero has completely lost his mind. He's demon-possessed, and he has unleashed this violent assault against every Christian he can find. So Timothy is finding a lot of his elders, a lot of those that he trusted are abandoning him to save their, for self-preservation. They're just trying to save their lives. So it's not like, oh, he's pastoring this big church and it's just, you know, he's driving with a, his, you know, in his convertible with the top down on Ocean Drive. Just, a, <laughs> man, this guy's in this battle. The smell of blood is in the air. It is a violent, horrific time to be a believer. They've got, he's got the assault of the Roman government, and then he's got the religious leaders as well. And so Timothy's finding himself in this difficult time, and what does Paul say? The only thing he can do, he can't go there, he can just write a letter. 
And Paul says, the only thing he can say, one of the things that he says, rather, not the only thing, but he says, I want to remind you to stir up the gift of God that was, that was deposited in you through the laying on the, of the hands of the elders. In other words, Timothy, do you remember when we laid hands on you, there was an impartation that took place. The Holy Spirit flooded your life. The fire of God began to consume you. Now you're going to need to stir up the fire of God, the gift of God that's in you, if you're going to make it. Otherwise, you're not going to, you're going to lose. This thing's going to get the best, it's going to best you. It's going to get the better of you. Unless you stir up that gift. And that word stir up is actually one word in the Greek. We translate it two words, stir up, right? But it's actually one word in the Greek and it means to rekindle. So it paints the picture of a fire, whether it's a campfire or a fire in a fireplace that it's been blazing for a while, you know, it's full of the right kind of wood and stacked just right and it's just going and it's been going for a while. But then over time, we know what happens, right? Right? The campfire or the fireplace. We don't use fireplaces much here, do we? I have one. I've never used it. <laughs> this is South Texas. But, but one of the things I like about South Texas as opposed to other beaches, you know, that I've been to, Bonnie and I've been to that are so fancy you can't drive on them. Ah. You can't do a campfire on the beach. Come on. Give me a good old Texas beach that you can drive on and put a big old bonfire on there and get some s'mores going, you know. Give me one of those kind of beaches, right? S'mores, you guys know what s'mores, s'mores are, That's it, right? Y'all looking real spiritual like you don't eat s'mores. But, but, you know, you get those campfires going and you get the wood stacked just right and then it starts getting, so over time, the fire gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It's not as hot. It's not as effective. It's, you really can't do much with it. It's almost about ready to go out. And then you just, there's some coals there. There's some embers there. There's enough there. There's enough, a little bit of wood there. And there's enough heat there and enough hot coals there. You begin to move that around. And you, what do you do? You stir that up. And then you begin to stoke it with some new wood as you're stirring it up in that fire. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. Timothy, man, your fire is going out, son. And I'm telling you, it's up to you. The Holy Spirit was given to you as a gift. You received it through the laying on of our hands. But it's up to you to stir it up. It's up to you to keep the flame going, to rekindle that flame if you're going to be victorious. These are the days you're in, Timothy. Nero's not going to get better. He's not even going to get saved. He's killing everybody around you. You're going to be gripped with fear if you don't keep that fire alive, right? So stir it up. Matter of fact, the Amplified actually translate. I mean, actually translates it this way. This is why I would remind you to stir up rekindle the embers of, fan the flame of, and keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire, the inner fire, so that you by, by means of laying on, by the laying on of my hands with those elders at your ordination. So in other words, just fan that flame. Stay hungry. Fan the flame. Stir it up. There's several ways for us to do that, but, but honestly, the time that we spend in the scriptures, the time that we spend in the word, the time that we spend in worship and in prayer, all of those things, guys, all of those things keep the fire going. But let me tell you what else. Proximity. The right proximity helps you and I to fan the flame as well. And here's what I mean by that. In Exodus chapter 33, for example, it says that Moses was speaking, and in the tabernacle, Moses was speaking face to face with God. It says, as a man speaks with his friend. Then after he was done talking, he would return to the camp. But the verse goes on to say, but Joshua, his servant, did not depart from the tabernacle. So if you can imagine this, everyone's in their tent. Moses is in the tabernacle, the meeting place where God's presence is. And he's meeting with God face to face. And Joshua's not in there. 
but he's as close as he can possibly be. He's right at the door. He's right outside the tent. And he's just, he's making sure he's as close as he can possibly be. Even so much so that when Moses leaves, Joshua does it. He stays there. He wants to be near God's presence. He wants to be near where God's at. He doesn't want, he understands how close, how, um, rather how important the proximity is. I want to be as close as I possibly can be. So what's one of the ways that we continue to fan the flame is that we make sure that we're eliminating the things in our lives that distance us from God. Right? Whether it's unforgiveness, bitterness, lust, whatever it is. But those things that cause us to, that, that create a distance between us and God. Those things that affect our sense of confidence in approaching God. That the proximity, and, and listen, listen, a lot of those things can be good things, not just sins, but there are things that are good things that can become distractions. And instead of being close and being right outside the tabernacle, being close to the Lord, pressing in to him and to his presence so we can continue to fan the flame, we allow ourselves to be distracted. I'm not saying that certain, th- I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm just saying if we want to keep the, the fire alive, there are times where the Lord will actually call us away from good things to be close to him. I mean, you know, it may be, for me, it may be times where I know I don't, I'm not going to watch those two episodes of the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> Anybody know that show? Yeah, most of you know that show, right? Or The Rifleman or Dick Van Dyke. I just rattled off my three favorite shows that I watch all the time. Have you, how many times have you seen them? Gazillions. <laughs> they never get old. Barney never becomes less funny in the Andrew Griffith show. <laughs> and I just discovered a new show. It's not a new show. It was in the early 70s. And, and um, most of you, a lot of you weren't alive then, but it was in the early 70s. I just, but I, I, for whatever reason, I didn't watch this show. I don't know why. Bonnie watched it. But I, I, this particular show, for some reason, I didn't watch. I was all about the Andy Griffith show. I was all about the rifle man and that rifle of his. Matter of fact, I accidentally shot my neighbor's window out trying to pretend to be the rifle man with my BB gun. That didn't go over well. I realized I'm not Lucas McCain, who is the main character. In the, but you know, all of the, but I finally found a show. I, I, I don't know how I stumbled on. I knew about the show. It wasn't like I didn't know about it. I just never watched it. And it's the Waltons. Anybody watch the Waltons? Let me see your hands if you watch the Waltons. Five, six, seven, no, there's more. There's a few. A lot of you don't know the show. It's just this, but there, you can't find a more wholesome show. You can't find a more wholesome, family-oriented, beautiful, wonderful, beautiful messages, all of this stuff, the life lessons that they learn and they go to church. And, I mean, you can't find a better TV show to watch. Then I'm all about the Waltons right now. I'm watching them. John Boy, all of them, you know. But there are times where the Lord will call you and I away from even good things to be, at the, to be right at the front door of the tab, to be in his presence, to experience his presence, to hear his voice, to listen to what he has to say, directing us to his word. Are you following? Yes, everybody. And that's how we keep the, f- that's how we keep the fire alive. That's how we fan it. It's up to us. It's our responsibility, right? But I, my point is, is that don't, don't, don't get tripped up here that he, he, he'll call us even to walk away from the good things to experience the best thing, which is sitting at his feet. Amen? And so if we're going to experience the victory that God's called us to in these days, we need to keep the fire alive. Here's the second thing. We need to be generous financially. We need to be generous financially. So I'll just tell you, I'm not leading up to an offering. Though I, I like doing offerings. I like receiving offerings. I like to give. I like to give you an opportunity to give. But my point, what I'm saying now is I'm talking about the uncertainty of the world that we live in. And one of the, one, if you, when you read the, the scriptures, 
Particular, particularly in the New Testament, you find that one of, the, one of the primary characteristics of the followers of Jesus is they were generous with their money. They were generous with their resources. Even in a time where they were experiencing uh, extreme poverty, you would see the generosity of the believers rise up above the poverty of the area and it caught everybody's attention. And so if we're going to experience and walk in the victory that God's called us to, folks, I'm telling you, we need to be generous people. And I don't, I don't, we need, of course, we need to be generous with our love, with our forgiveness, with our kindness. I'm saying also in addition to that, we need to be generous with our finances. Paul said in in Corinthians, in, in 2 Corinthians, he told the church, he says, as you abound in these things in faith, as you abound in speech and you're preaching the word, as you abound in all of these things, Paul says, make sure you abound in this grace as well. And he's talking about the grace of giving. Then he went on and talked about how important it was for them to give their resources or their finances. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that for a couple of different reasons. Because if we're generous, then we're not given to the love of money. If we're generous, then greed doesn't have a grip on us. And let me tell you something about greed. You can, you can be, you can be living at the poverty level in our nation and still be greedy. Greed is not just reserved for wealthy people. You could be, you could be struggling financially and still greed can have a grip on your heart. Why? Because greed is a hard issue. It's not a money issue. Because there are wealthy people that are followers of Jesus. They are not greedy at all. But people assume because they have money, they got it because, they, because, of, their, because of their greed. It's not necessarily true. You can earn $20,000, $15,000 a year, $30,000 a year, and be greedy. Thank you for that thunderous response, but it's true. Because it's not about, greed isn't about money. It's not about how much you have or don't have. Greed is a heart issue. Greed comes down to who is the Lord of that area of my life? Who's the Lord of the finances of my life? Finances, the things that I'm able to use to bring security to my family, food and clothing and a roof over my head. So who's the Lord of that? Who rules in that area of my life? Does Jesus rule or do I reserve that part for myself because I'm convinced I can protect me better than he can. And if that's what I think, I'm going to hold on to everything I got. I'm going to squeeze that penny until Abraham Lincoln's crying. I'm going to hold on to that money because my fear is if I let it go, I'm going to, I'm going to be without and I'm going, to, I'm going to end up on the bottom end of life. Well, that might be true if our faith and confidence is in the government or in the world's economy, then that's probably true. But if our faith is in God, then I'm telling you this, I've never seen God's children, I've never seen God abandon his children. I've never seen his seed forsake, forsaken or his children begging for bread. Jesus said, the Lord knows how to take care of his children. But Jesus said this, that he said, we are to lay up treasures in heaven. So there are two types of treasures. There's earthly treasures, there's, he- there's heavenly treasures. But what Jesus said is that if you're laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven, he's saying what your generosity on earth is connected to the treasures you have in heaven. I'm going to say it again. The generosity that you and I demonstrate on the earth is directly connected to the treasures that we have in heaven. That's why the kingdom of God is described in agricultural terms all the time. Farming. Plant a seed, here's the harvest. Here's how the seed works. Here's the kind of seed you plant. Here's the kind of ground you want to plant your seed in. Once you plant your seed in good ground, here's, here's what happens. It begins to grow and here's what the enemy of the fruit of that seed is. Here's how fast it grows. Here's how slow it grows. But the big idea is this, that God is the Lord of the harvest. The Holy Spirit is the Lord of the harvest. But a farmer can only harvest what he's planted. He cannot plant and then walk up to an empty field and go, well, where's my, where's my harvest? It's, not the, it's the seed in the ground that produces the harvest, not the seed in the barn. We live in uncertain times. I do not trust the government. 
I don't. Okay? Now, we're going to be respectful and honoring and all that, but I guarantee you I'm not trusting them to take care of Bonnie and I at the end of the day. We're making sure we got lots of seed in the ground, money that we're sowing and giving towards the advancement of the gospel as well as to help others and other ministries as well as this church. We give a lot to this church. We give a lot to other ministries. And, and so we're doing that because I know that, when you, that whatever a man sows, that's what he reaps. So if you sow anger, you reap it. If you sow unforgiveness, you reap it. If you sow judgment, you reap it. But also if you sow generosity, you reap the provision of God on a whole nother level. Does this make sense, everybody? Yes or no? And, and, and here's the thing, when God asks us to give and to be generous towards his kingdom or towards others, what he's asking us to do is he's asking us to carve out a space for him to step in and fill. That's how we had this outpouring that started in 2018. That's continued for five years, five, almost 5,000, probably more, uh, 5,000 baptisms in five years. Things that are happening in the schools, things that are happening in the university, things that are happening in families. Just the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What happened? Well, we created space for him that we were occupying with other stuff. And he says, I want you to kind of strip down all that extra stuff and all the accoutrements that you think you need. And I want you to give me some space because I'll fill it. And so we gave him some space and he filled the space we gave him. And then we realize that's the only space he can fill. And then I connected, uh, though Bonnie and I have been tithing and giving for years, I connected another little dot. I had another little aha moment. Now we've given faithfully, but I realized, oh, that's something else that's happening. When we give faithfully, when we're giving our 10% or we're being generous financially, what we're doing is we're telling the Lord, number one, that we're not, we're not trusting the economy around us to be our provider. Number two, we're literally, when we give and we take money out and give it away, we're creating space for him to step into and be our provider. And he's, I feel like he says, look, I'd love to provide you on, in a greater way, but I can't shimmy in there because you're there holding on to everything and you won't give anything away. If you'll just start being a giver, you're going to create space. Then I'm going to slip in there and watch me provide for you. I can do it better than you can do it for yourself. So as we move further down the road, and as our economy becomes more and more unpredictable, I don't want any of us in this room to be gripped with fear. You know why ultimately people will take the mark of the beast? Fear. They won't be able to buy or sell. And do you think people get to that place overnight? No. That dependency on government is created over time. Until it gets to the point where the Antichrist comes to power and he says, all right, you're going to take this mark that's going to mark you for me. You're going to be marked for Satan. And if you don't, you can't buy or sell, which means you're going to starve to death. You won't be able to get the medication you need. You're going you're gonna to die. Your children are going to die. Your spouse is going to die. And it's out of fear because we're more dependent on the world than we are on who, the one who created the world. Right? Does this make sense, everybody? Amen. I know. Bonnie and I have done this for 40-some years, 43 years. We know God can provide for us. We've seen him do it supernaturally. The point is, is I love the condition of our heart right now. I love the fact that we're not gripped with fear. I, you know how you, our, what we give and how we give is the only proof whether or not we've conquered greed. You and I can say how, I'm not greedy. Okay. Here. Oh, no. I'm not doing that. Well, it looks like you gave maybe 2% of your income all year to the things of God. I think you're greedy. It's not because you don't love the Lord. It may be because you're afraid. So Jesus said in Matthew 6, look, you see the birds of the air? You see the lilies of the field? Your heavenly father takes care of them so good. And you're worth a ton more to him than any of these. 
So he says this, your heavenly father knows what you need. He wants to make sure you've got food in your belly. He wants to make sure you've got clothes on your back. He wants to make sure you've got a roof over your head. So Jesus was trying to, he was at first talking to them about how much God loves them and how much he desires to take care of them and how he is for them and how he is committed to them, right? And then he says, and for you to walk into that, walk in that provision, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all this other stuff will be added to you. You don't even have to worry about it. He's got you. He's got you. Amen. Just seek him first, and he's got you. Amen? Yeah? The, the, third thing that we, the third thing that we need to be, that we need in days like this is we need to put off falsehood and live honestly before men. Honestly before God, honestly before men. Second Corinthians says we are careful to be honorable before the Lord, and we want uh, everyone else to see that we are honorable as well. Honorable, that word honorable literally means to be approved or to be proved genuine after being tested. That we're honorable. Ladies and gentlemen, that we're truthful. That we speak the truth. That we don't live in deception. We don't twist. We don't spin. We don't lie. We're honest, bef we're honest before God. And we're honest before men. We tell the truth. We walk in the truth. We live the truth. Amen? If a person is in the habit of lying or bending the truth for their own means, for their own desires. They want to get their way in something or avoid a penalty or whatever. And they have a tendency to be not, they're not truthful, they're not honest. They're not walking in the truth. They're not walking in truth. The problem with that is they may feel like they're getting away with things because they're really good at lying because they've done it so long. But at some point in time, they're going to face something in their life and you know what they're going to need to deliver them? The power of the truth. But they've been an enemy of truth with their deception. So they won't be able to recognize that truth, nor will they be able to walk in or experience the power of that truth to deliver them because they've lived in the darkness. Does this make sense, everybody? So the Bible says, just walk out of the darkness. We're not we've been delivered out of the darkness, so stop walking in it. Right? The old man's dead and the old man lied a lot in Colossians chapter 3. That's what Paul said. So tell the truth. Be honest. And lie not. Amen. There's just something powerful. And, 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 and there's something that, that, that establishes our character. There's something that strengthens our faith. There's something that, that even connects us. That even strengthens our faith in God when we can be honest. Amen. Here's the fourth one. You ready? We need to fan the flame to keep the fire alive. We need to be generous financially. We need to be generous people. We need to have seed. We need to be sowers. We need to put away falsehood and live honestly. Just be honest. Just make sure your pants never catch on fire. <laughs> liar, liar. Yeah, okay. That's a bad joke, I know. But number four is we need to pursue sexual purity. We need to be sexually pure. And the reason why I'm mentioning this specifically is because it's one of the primary ways that Satan destroys lives is through sexual immorality. The devil desires to, con most oftentimes he conquers man, mankind, he conquers man Sexually first, to compromise himself sexually, to, to fall into or embrace sexual sin before he's able to completely conquer his life. Lives have been destroyed because of sexual indiscretions, just foolishness. Careers have been destroyed. Companies have been destroyed because of sexual sin. Does this make sense, everybody? And so there's something. So here's what, here's what Paul says, uh, or, or Peter says, rather, in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. 
Fleshly lusts that we give into wars against our soul. They, they wage war against our soul, our emotions. We, we, we can't, our feelings are all messed up. We think, and then we're living by what we feel. Or our minds, our thoughts come under the domain or dominion of the enemy. And, and, and so Peter says when we give in to fleshly lust, it wars against our soul. In, in uh, 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 Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, put to death your members here on the earth. And one of the first things he mentions is fornication and uncleanness. Sexual uncleanness and fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says this, flee sexual immorality. So we, there are so many scriptures that talk about you and I fleeing sexual immorality and pursuing sexual purity. And the reason why, again, is this is how the enemy will destroy our lives. So I, I think I mentioned this to you once before, but in the book of Numbers, Balaam kept trying to curse Israel. Now, Balaam was a false prophet. He was a seer. He was, so they paid him money to do this. So Balak paid him money to curse Israel. I want you to curse them. And so Balaam would try to curse Israel. Three times he tried. And he would get ready. All right, I'm going to curse him. Give me the money. I got the money. All right, I'm going to curse him. Here I go. Israel's blessed of the Lord. I mean, he kept blessing them. He didn't know where it was coming from. I'll try a second time. Same thing happened. He ended up blessing Israel instead of cursing. Third time, same thing happened. And after the third time, Balaam told Balak, don't ask me to do this anymore because every time I open my mouth to curse Israel, I end up blessing Israel. But then Balaam says, I think I have an idea on how to, I can't curse Israel, but I think I have an idea on how I can get Israel to curse herself. Balaam's like, how's that? So, well, you know, the, the Israeli men have been away from their wives for a while. Let's get these beautiful Moabite women to come and parade themselves in front of the Israeli men and get them to lust and enter into sexual immorality with them. And in Numbers, it says that that's exactly what happened. So the men of Israel ended up having sexual relations with the Moabite women. So that, that was the first mistake that they made is that they, they walked outside of sexual purity and they had sex with these women. And here's the second thing that happens that we see in the scriptures. Then they led these men to the idols of Baal where they worship Baal. They conquered him sexually first before they, and then they conquered them spiritually. Solomon, 700 wives, 300 concubines, 700 wives, 300, seven, a thousand, what? How many of you would agree with me he had a problem? That's a problem. That's a problem. In modern days, we would have branded a sexual pervert. He would have been a sex addict. The wisest man other than Jesus that ever lived on the earth that wisdom came directly from God, the wisest man, and he was taken down by sexual immorality. God never commanded, God never commanded man to have more than one wife. They did, some of them did. Many of them didn't, but the ones that did always had problems in their family, including David, Solomon's father. Okay? And at the end of Solomon's life, his heart was turned from the Lord and he was worshiping the idols of the women that he brought into his tent. It was through sexual immorality that caused this great mighty man to fall. Are you following what I'm saying? In the days in which we live where perversity is celebrated and in our face all the time, man, we need to be as marked by God's children. We need to pursue sexual purity and flee sexual immorality like our hair is on fire. That's how we run away from it. Right? Jesus, when Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hands offends you, cut it off. He wasn't talking about literally doing that. What he was saying is, eliminate it. Eliminate the stuff that draws you and I into sexual immorality or into lust.
Don't just cut it back. When you cut it back, you're pruning. It's just going to come back stronger. Cut it off. Pluck it out. Amen? Yes or no? There's just some stuff we shouldn't be looking at, some stuff we shouldn't be near, some stuff we shouldn't be paying attention to. Can I get a witness in this house? Sexual purity. Here's the last, here's the last one. And that is, in this world that we find ourselves in, we also need to, to not love our own lives. Revelation chapter 12 says this, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even to the point of death. There may be some things that some of us here are flirting with. Maybe we're, we've been flirting with greed a little bit financially. Maybe we've been flirting with sexual areas, improprieties. We're, we're laxed. We've been loose. We've been careless. We haven't been vigilant to guard our sexual purity. Not, not necessarily, not, maybe it's the things that we're doing. It may be also the things that we're looking at. Maybe we're not fanning the flame and that flame is gone and our heart has cooled before the Lord. I'm telling you, today is the perfect day for the Holy Spirit to do his work in our lives. Amen? And then, of course, again, as I said, this last one is that how, we're, how we can live with victory in this world today is to live in a way that we realize our lives don't belong to us. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I that live, but Christ that lives within me. And the life I now live, the, not, the life I do live, I live by faith in the Son of God. That I've picked up my cross and I've denied myself. That I do not love my own life, even to the point of death, because it's not my life, it's his life. I don't belong to me, I belong to him. No man lives to himself, no man dies to himself. We belong to the Lord. We are his possession. It's not my life, not my body, not my choice. It's all him. Amen? And, and if we're going to make it in this world, we got to live at that place. That's the place we have to live at. You know, years ago, uh, there was a, back in the early 60s, there was a, a missionary, a, Assemblies of God missionary by the name of Jay Tucker. Um, Jay Tucker passed away, or passed away, he was actually, he was actually uh, murdered in 1965. Um, he felt called, he and his family, his wife and his kids, uh, to the country of Zaire, which back then was called the nation of Congo, the African nation of Congo back in the early 60s. Today it's called Zaire. But Jay Tucker um, served, I think, five terms, which means he was there for, I think, 18 months or two years. Uh, and then he'd come home stateside, he and his family, and then they'd go back. Well, he was, this was his fifth time back. Back. And Zaire began to experience some inner turmoil. There was a revolution. Some rebels rose up. And different tribes were battling and fighting one another. And Jay, as this white man and this missionary, got somehow got in the middle of it and became a target for one of the rebels. And they decided they needed to kill him. They drug him to the center of town in the center square. And they beat him to death. Then they took his lifeless body, placed it in the back of a pickup truck. Then they drove that truck to the... Uh, to the uh, Bomokandi River and dumped the body in the Bomokandi River. Now that river would flow, actually flew through a tribe, a particular tribe called the Mangbeto tribe. The Mangbeto tribe. And so even though this was horrific, even though there's this kind of coup going on, this upset, this tumultuous time, these, these rebels, this, this, uh, all of this unrest happening, there was still, they still tried to maintain some type of law and order. And so they felt like they still needed to investigate the death of Jay Tucker. So they sent one policeman, that was all. We don't know his name, but he was called the Brigadier. Nobody, I don't even know why he was called that. But he was a, he was a large man. Uh, he was kind of an imposing uh, gentleman. Uh, he had a good reputation among several of the tribes, but he was sent to try to investigate the death of Jay Tucker. And so obviously uh, the, the body was dumped. It ran through and, and the body was recovered by some of the Mangbetu tribesmen. And so the brigadier went to talk to the Mangbetus. 
He knew that there was a, I don't want to call it a law or there was some type of, 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 of principle, that, that, that some type of, not a mandate, but some, that, that, I don't know, what, I don't know, I'm not sure the word of it that, that, to, to call it, but, but here's, what, here's what, we'll call it a law, here's what it was, and that was this, we will always listen, we will always hear the words of anyone whose blood has been shed in our river. They're talking about the Bomo Candy River that anyone who'd lost their lives or their blood was mingled within that, the waters of this river, we will always listen to their words. And so the brigadier had an idea. So as he was investigating the death of Jay Tucker and as he's meeting with the Mangbetu tribe, what, what they didn't know was that a couple of years previously, Jay Tucker led the brigadier to the Lord Jesus Christ as his savior. So the brigadier is a born-again Christian. And he, rec- and he realizes, because of who he is, he realizes this kind of law that they have, that they will listen to the words of any man whose blood was shed in their river. And so the brigadier went to the uh, Mangbetus and he, he, he gathered the chief and the elders together. And he says, you know, I know that one of the rules, one of the laws of of the tribe here is that you will always, no matter who it is, you'll listen to the words of anyone whose blood is mingled into the waters of this river. Well, I'm going to tell you about a man. He can't speak for himself because he's dead. But I'm going to speak for him because I'm going to tell you the words he told me. And then he proceeded to preach the gospel. And they got saved. And in a short period of time, there were 40 different churches within the Mangbetu tribe. And that was back in the early 60s, mid-60s. There's probably more than that. Of course, who knows the domino effect that took place because a man by the name of Jay Tucker didn't play it safe because he realized his life was not his own. And the sacrifice of his life resulted in the salvation of probably hundreds or more than that. Maybe thousands, maybe even more than that. Let's stand to our feet. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, as we take these final moments to worship you and for you to just examine our hearts, maybe there's some of us that, in all honesty, the flame's gone out, or we've wrestled with trusting you with our provisions, or we've flirted with sexual immorality and we've been careless in that area. Or we just haven't been honest and living honorably. Lord, we're just asking, Holy Spirit, I'm asking right now for you to just begin to move across this crowd and begin to speak to us. And may there just be a spirit of obedience, a spirit of surrender as you begin to move on the hearts of your people. Mm. May we be obedient. May we finally let go of what you're asking. Stop holding on so tightly. May we take that first step. May we find that place of surrender again, or maybe even for the first time a place of total surrender. But Spirit of God, you're you're here and you're doing your work and you're calling your people. You're changing and transforming, strengthening and lifting, convicting and convincing, leading and guiding. And our desire is to just respond, to respond quickly and to respond in obedience. If the Lord is moving upon you, he's speaking to you. We do have folks here at the front that of our prayer teams that will pray with you. But the front of the stage can become an altar. It can become a place that you just lay it right there where you just kneel and just you and God just do business. You may want to go to the communion tables. You may need to take that next step and be baptized in water and just finally cut off the ties of the past. I'm just asking that whatever that might be, I want to give you an opportunity to move, to respond, to step out, to step up, to make yourself known to Him.
put your trust in him and to respond. Let's just worship him together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thanks so much for watching online. Uh, be sure to follow us on social media at New Life Corpus. And we would love to see you in person on a Sunday morning at our 9, 11, or 1 p.m. service. God bless.